In a great hall with pillars hewn out of the living stone sat the elven king on a chair of carven wood. In the book, Thranduil is not fully drawn, so to speak, as a character. In fact, he's not actually named in The Hobbit, except to say that he is the elven king. Tolkien doesn't really describe anything more than he's the king of the woodland realm. But, you know, in a film, you can't quite get away with some of the simplicity that you can in a book, especially a book written for younger people. It has to feel real. And that's one of the rules that we've always given ourselves with these films, is to have our characters have a degree of complexity. Kate Blanchett and Hugo Weaving and Orlando Bloom created such iconic elves. And so here I had this new elf to play with, and I was thinking, what makes this very powerful king of elves different than them? <laughs> He's an elf with dungeons. You know, that's, there's a lot to that. <laughs> One of the screenwriter's strengths in this film is to actually remain faithful to what's in the book, but nevertheless add all those dimensions to characters like Thranduil. As filmmakers, we take our clues from the, the, I mean, Tolkien, obviously, we take our guidance from the book. The king's cave was his palace, and the strong place of his treasure, and the fortress of his people against their enemies. Thranduil's underground kingdom in the forest is really uh, an echo or a parallel to this elven king, Thingol, who's featured in Tolkien's earlier stories. And Thingol lived in a hill underground in this amazing guarded realm called Manigroth. For the woodland realm, we chose to take that a little bit further and create this king who is now literally in a state where his people are shut off from the outside world. No one enters this kingdom and no one leaves it. If the Elf King had a weakness, it was for treasure, especially for silver and white gems. And so that became an interesting idea. It was like, okay, where did this come from? The Elven King, the character himself, is inspired by a character from Tolkien's earlier writings, uh, King Thingol Greycloak. Thingol, also like Thranduil, has his weaknesses, and one of them is passion for the jewels, and that was a kind of recurring theme in Tolkien's writing. And we thought, okay, so maybe that's something that you can turn into a character story. There are gems in the mountain that I too desire. White gems of pure starlight. Because we needed to know why he would march upon that mountain without it feeling greedy. So what we decided was that these gems had a meaning for him. The heirlooms of my people are not lightly forsaken. In ancient days, they had had wars with some of the dwarves, whom they accused of stealing their treasure. We've seen all of that in earlier writings that predate The Hobbit. King Thingol had a great quarrel with the dwarves, which is what Tolkien referred to in The Hobbit. Thingol arranges for the dwarves to make a necklace for him, but then there is a dispute over payment and ownership. Now, there's some real contention as to what exactly happened, but the, uh, the dwarves actually went in and killed Thingol in his own halls. In revenge, the elves go after the dwarves, and they wipe these guys out. So you can understand the intensity of the blood feud between these two races that persists for thousands of years afterwards. We took that story thread about a dispute over jewels that Professor Tolkien in the Book of the Hobbit ascribes to past grievances and expanded on it. And it began to help us shape Thranduil. The film did rather well in motivating Thranduil's refusal to help the dwarves when Smaug attacked. Help us! And the dwarves' deep resentment of the fact that he refused to help. Well, that's not in the book, but it is, I think, uh, quite consistent with the way that Tolkien presents, the elves in particular. Tolkien clearly was inspired by his own construction of King Thingol living in the caves in the Great Forest. But we don't know whether the elven king in The Hobbit was originally intended to be Thingol or a Thingol-like character. And it's not until he starts writing the sequel that he decides, no, this is a new character. 
we find out his name in um, The Lord of the Rings when we meet his son, Legolas Greenleaf. My Govanen, Legolas Thranduilion. Govanna Svinguenenle, Haldir Olorien. One of the things that we got to do in The Hobbit is to bring in the character of Legolas. He's not actually in the book, but I think we would have probably been killed if we hadn't met Legolas in these movies. Do not think I won't kill you, dwarf. It's highly likely that uh, Legolas was still living at home with his dad <laughs> at the events of The Hobbit, um, and why not have him part of the story? Taking advantage of the fact that we have now the, the full picture of Tolkien's family tree, as it were. One of the things that was interesting for me about Legolas being a part of The Hobbit was for me to get to go back and create a backstory for Legolas, and particularly the father-son relationship. Why did you do that? You promised to set him free. And I did. Thranduil is really a very complex character, you know. He's an elf with, uh, with an axe to grind, you know, which is um, normally a dwarf's job, right? Stay here, if you will, and rot. A hundred years is a mere blink in the life of an elf. You get the sense when you meet Thranduil that his agendas are so obviously distinct and his superiority is so evident that there's something frightening. And that's a different quality that we haven't seen before in an elven leader. Thranduil is nefarious, he's duplicitous, he's a commanding individual. All of these elements, you would think, inform a very clarifying view of a character. They don't. They just make it more and more complex to find that beautiful and refined piece of design that is going to perfectly represent that individual. We explored all kinds of different ideas for Thranduil back in the days with Guillermo del Toro in the beginning. And one was an Orientalist kind of influence that was coming through in terms of headdresses, in terms of makeup, in terms of costuming. Some of the ideas I was playing with, because we were sort of pushing this more Orientalist sort of idea, was he's obviously someone really quite stone cold, kind of quite imposing and intimidating, that would have sort of a mantle that could have a slightly armored feel to it, and a, a crown that was kind of sort of dangerous looking, quite spiny. We, we even started playing around with the idea of painting tattoos on their skin, like with the henna painting in some cultures where they paint pattern work onto themselves as a decorative device. A lot of kooky ideas were cooked up early on because Guillermo inspires people to really go laterally and think broadly. Of course, when Pete came on board, it was important that every character in the movie now complemented his vision for his film. And that required us to revisit the owls. And um, have you got any thoughts of an actor that we can base them on? It, not, not that you may have cast someone, but even someone that we could design around body type. Casting elves is honestly a nightmare. I mean, there's no point casting an elf if he looks like he's 55 years old or 60 years old. But at the same time, you can't have an 18-year-old, beautiful, fresh-faced person playing a 1,000-year-old elf. I mean, elves are immortal. So that's always our problem. And we had seen Lee Pace in a movie um, called The Fall. He was really quite remarkable in that film. When it came to looking for Thandral, we remembered Lee. And we met him in New York on a casting trip. That week, I was so kind of excited to meet with them. I'm such a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings series that, you know, I kind of rewatched them all. I got the director's cut, watched that, watched all the documentaries, and kind of just put myself in Middle Earth. How far did they travel? Well, we tracked them as far as the Great Oak Clearing. And there you killed them? Yes, my lord. You killed them all? You do not think to keep one of them alive? Oh, uh, it was dark. We were outnumbered. I don't care if you were fighting alone in blind. I do not accept incompetence from a captain of my guard. Lee had that gravity. He had a sense that he could be a thousand years old. He could be immortal, but also that he had lived. He had lived a long life. He had seen a lot, and he had been through a lot and that Lee really brought that feeling to the role. It's a role, my fighter, my golden-eyed assassin. You have skill and cunning. You could go far. Thranduil, in my mind, started out as kind of the anti-Elrond. He doesn't sit and have conversations with wizards about the best possible course of action to benefit Middle-earth as a whole. 
he's just out for pursuing his own agenda. And so where Elrond is very simple and elegant in his costumery, with Thrand will be the opportunity to actually go quite elaborate and fanciful. Conceptually, you know, his look, uh, it was really hard to get right. He is a king born and bred. Everything that was being drawn initially was trying to add that to him when actually he doesn't need it. There was kind of an aha moment when Philippa said, you know, you want to think about this guy as a rock star. And instead of buttoning him up, let's open his neckline and let's give him an arrogance, but also a, a kind of a self-assured cockiness. And I kept going on and on and on about this. And it was like, you know, the really great designers, it's like the simplicity of a great suit. And I came across an image of Tom Ford. Tom Ford is the American designer who turned Gucci around. And he just looks so cool, lounging out on a chair. And I mean lounging, I mean like really lounging, like hanging out on one side, legs off to the other. And I, I was like, this, that's Thranduil. In the next pieces of artwork that I did, I changed the way he was sitting on his throne in my pictures to sort of throw himself around a little bit more. And that suddenly gave us a window into this character. And the costume design kind of took off from there. You sometimes you design costumes before you know who the actor is. You might be designing for someone in your mind that's six foot four and in walks someone five foot six. So anyway, with Lee, what you get is exactly what you want physically because he's tall and handsome and he's got the best shoulders to hang a costume on. God, now, that orange is just... Totally yummy. Yeah. The orange is phenomenal. He's money, the self king. I mean, it really is a fun character to dress up. Amazing. Working with Lee Pace was wonderful because he definitely wears clothes incredibly well. He's got a great presence and he also moves incredibly well, all adding to that movement of the King of the Elves. The source comes from here. <sighs> yes! That's the power. Thranduil really had this burning, threatening presence, but he really had to just rein everything in. So it was like this tornado that he was pulling back from just unleashing. What do I see myself going? <laughs> Elven movement training that we've done with Terry has kind of given me my entire character. It's not even about movement as much as it is about thought, kind of like as the wind and the ocean pulls and pushes. It's like that's how they move through space. You're riding these waves. It's like you're surfing. It's like you're surfing through space, and you get to go, oh, there's another wave. Yeah. Terry was great. When I got back to The Hobbit, it had been 10, 12 years. He brought me back to my inner elf. When Orlando first came in Lord of the Rings, I mean, he was, he's the elf that we all know. We didn't have a movements coach like Terry. So Orlando being the first elf, he had to create an elvish trademark. There was a sort of cat-like grace and presence, agility, constantly aware. All of those things that basically gave me the sense of being an immortal being. After 10 years of living my life, coming back to that kind of centered place of Legolas was really actually kind of wonderful. On the breath, feel it come from your center. The way Terry kind of cracked into this elven movement is that it's not just kind of a zen peacefulness it's like a relaxed engagement let it like be like a piss shiver that it, it almost lifts you up yeah okay piss shiver i don't even know what a piss shiver is all right guys we're gonna do some of the hardest shit there is all right see how when you get out of your head when you get out of the zone it's shit yeah, see that? It's all about. It's the yeah. fish show. It's <laughs> <laughs> When Orlando and Lee worked together, it was really helpful because it's a father-son relationship, and it was just nice to have them connect in a very private space before they get on set, because then they have that history. Ah, Legolas, Hun Hero. As Tolkien relates it later in The Lord of the Rings, Thrandu and Legolas are not Sylvan Elves. They are Sindar. The Sindar are among the elves who left to go to the Undying Lands and stopped along the way. But they had some contact with the Valar and the, and the powers that be. The Sindar Elves have been exposed to that divine influence and now they 
serve as kind of governors and guiders of the, uh, the Sylvan Elves, who make up kind of the mass of the Woodland Realm society. So one of the ways in which we tried to show that was very simply the white blonde hair. The, the, pure, the pure blonde would be Thranduil and Legolas. I think it's better to have not many others blonde, to tell no, the truth. I agree. Because it, then it makes Legolas and his dad so, sort of yeah, stand yeah, out as, sure. uh, as the royal kind of yeah. line. We had to make Thranduil sort of appear so supreme and really quite cold in his attitude. We decided he was above all hair ornamentation. We wanted them to look completely like he was in control. So although there was nothing holding his hair back, it never really moved. And then if it did, it was always very controlled, as if there was another force looking after his hair for him. The one thing I was afraid of is that they were going to pluck my eyebrows and do something crazy with my eyebrows. And I was like, Peter, please, no, please, let's <laughs> don't, don't, don't. <laughs> I originally did designs for him with a much more shaped eyebrow, like the other elves. In the end, we actually lifted his eyebrows with these little guy ropes you stick on, made of fish skin. So we did that to his eyebrow. Can I get a shot of your eyes? I'll just, I'll just get a shot. And I got wear these kind of icy gray contacts. They do have a slightly unnerving quality. <laughs> we had to use color contacts for him. He's got very dark eyes, a bit like Orlando. Legolas had blue eyes, so his father has to have blue eyes as well. Oh, the crown. The crown was like a tangled mass of roots and thorns with little tiny leaves inlaid into them, representing the leaves of the primary trees of Mirkwood. The crown designs that I gave him, I tried to put little barbs and bring everything to points so that, you know, if you're standing next to the guy and he turns his head, you're likely to get swiped, and he wouldn't care. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> don't! I just did it for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tolkien describes Thranduil as having this amazing crown of thorns with seasonal leaves and berries and flowers sort of mixed in with it. In the book, in other seasons, there are other things. On his head was a crown of berries and red leaves, for the autumn was come again. In the spring, he wore a crown of woodland flowers. They were shooting a scene that takes place in the prologue and that didn't make it into the movie. So when we were going to put this crown back on, I said, well, we should probably change the berries to something else. Here's the crown. Here's the crown. You want the berries painted as well, don't you? Yeah, let's just pull the berries out. Just, just take them off. Just take them out. What do you think? Because Burns the ever wise, the ever wisely pace. God it damn it! Don't you oh. blame me over this, Zane? <laughs> don't you put this on me? Are you talking seasonal? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna. What, I have like spear to do... leaves. You do. Well, yes. But they're all the same color. No, we need green ones. Mm -hmm. Zane, our executive producer, went out with the back of the lot and brought back in a plant and we just decorated the crown with that. That's what I'm talking about. It's green. That's, that, that's exactly what... Done. Shove that in. Shove that in that crown. You take the yellow flower off. Take the yellow flowers the off. You just wrap these in and Bob's your uncle. I don't know what the hell the problem is here. <laughs> Thank goodness you're here, Zane. I know. We're saving the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that happened on a daily basis with Zane, so um, he he saved the film every day. Quite oh, this looks, looks like a leggy sword, much looks, more than a thrand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me get a shot of you with that leggy, because it and might be the only time you hold it. Yes, <laughs> it will most definitely be the only time you hold it. Thranduil's sword is one of the most difficult swords that we've ever made, and therefore one of the most enjoyable objects we've ever made something very elven and very superior, almost samurai-like. I drew a sword that basically just one long barb of metal from grip and pommel all the way through to the blade. Pretty lethal looking shape. And I love the idea that there would be cutouts in the sword. We did do a, you know, a huge amount of, of work on the, on the Mirkwood Elves quite early on. And one of the elements that did endure and end up being carried through was this idea that many of the blades have what we came to call negative spaces in them, basically holes, which echo the engraving on the blade and to, to have light coming through in unexpected places.
His sword is the most sophisticated weapon that we made because it's made out of a single block of aluminium. And the hand grip is hollow and pierced. If you're into swords as we are, that gorgeous sword was really special. And I, when I was going through what uh, I saw it being carved, it's like this machine just kind of lasered carving it. It's a beautiful, beautiful weapon. Then to have Lee be so enthusiastic about it was really special. Right. God, is it great? <laughs> <laughs> Richard, it's fucking great. <laughs> Lee didn't hold it aloft. He didn't hold it across his body. He immediately dropped it down towards the floor and turned, and the sword became an extension not of his body, but of his purpose, of his arrogance as Thrandral. And it was like, oh, God, cool moment. Weta is just amazing. It's like every room you go into, this room they're sewing scales onto elven armor, and then you go into the next room and they're sculpting orc heads, and then they're doing the prosthetics for the dwarves in the next room, and then you go and there's like a sword master in the next room working out the blades. I said to Richard Taylor, I was like, um, I want a job here. In uh, Lee's downtime between filming, Lee started popping in too, and he actually threw himself straight into the work. I painted some armor for dwarves. I made some dwarf crossbows. It's kind of ironic that they had me making dwarf stuff. I'm playing the king of the elves, man. Tolkien's elves are almost superhuman in respect of their abilities when it comes to combat. And the fact that they have been around for thousands of years, you'd have to pick up a thing or two. <laughs> Thrangel, you know, he's the, the greatest warrior that you're ever going to see in Middle Earth. You see what Legolas can do. <laughs> so the challenge now is, well, here's his dad. One day Pete called us all together and the subject was Thrandral and his fighting style. That's all right, just come and sit down then. We originally wanted him to be this all action, all flying, all jumping, all kung fu expert type fighter. Peter wanted as many ideas as possible, and he just came to the previous team and just said, well, give us me as many ideas as possible so he could cherry pick what he wanted. It was forefront in our minds that the father to Legolas would have an even more dynamic and extraordinary fighting style. But the more the conversations evolved, the more clear it became that because of who Thrandral is as a character, as we saw him develop through the movies, he needed a, a much greater level of heightened efficiency. Oh, so less is better, so... Oh, it looks more yeah, not, not as flamboyant as Legolas. Yeah, right, I think, I think the jumping and the swinging and probably not so much no, with no. Thandral. He's more yeah. just, just deadly with these two swords, like cool. a couple of razor blades slicing through the orcs. If we went back half his lifetime, you'd see Legolas in Thandral because he'd be acrobatic, he'd be doing his flamboyant stuff. But then over the years, he learnt, why waste that energy? Why not go back to simplicity and just make it uh, do only what you need to do? He keeps that blade close to him. And even when he is defending, it's offensive. He gets close to his enemy. A lot of that fight stuff was Zor Lee, who wanted to do everything of his own. I mean, he was so dedicated into putting that time into learning to use both swords. And your hand comes, comes to the outside of your shoulder. Oh. We designed quite a lot of sweeping overhead movements, dynamic kind of swirling sword stuff that are over his head, and a few glimpses within the fight. You might even say it was quite matadorish. When you watch him, you could see, okay, if you know, think about matador, oh, yeah, you can sort of see that little style in him, very upright, very erect. But the way he used the weapons was so fast, he actually cut through the enemy like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> The Battle of the Five Armies fundamentally changes everything for Thrandall. His eyes are opened, and the Thrandall that we see after that is a man who is re-engaging with the world.
Your key characters, you want to feel that at the end of your story, they're not the same as they were at the beginning. And we've tried to do that with Dandrel. When we were developing and writing and structuring uh, the films, we had a backstory for these white gems that he literally goes to war over. And we thought, okay, these gems were made and fashioned for his wife and that she never got to wear them. I know an elf lord who will pay a pretty price for these. He had lost his great love, his wife, which is why Thrandor wants the diamonds, and he is willing to go to war for them. There's a necklace in that mountain. White gems strung upon silver. I want it retrieved. It's also one of the reasons that he's withdrawn from the world in the northern reaches of Mirkwood is because he's suffered such great loss. The Elven Gate. Thrangel's built this beautiful statue in memory of her and had it placed at the entrance to Mirkwood, which is really the entrance to his realm. There is no grave, no memory. In the books, we never hear anything about Legolas's mother. We imagine that she was lost to him. The ancient kingdom of Angmar. My mother died there. My father does not speak of it. By the time you get to the Battle of the Five Armies, you get a sense at the end, certainly, of a character who's beginning to soften. Why does it hurt so much? When Tariel loses Keeley, there is very much a connection that, that you know of what that loss is about. Her pain, her having loved, makes him see what he has become. And it awakens something inside of him. Sympathy, kindness. And those are coming back to someone who we've only ever seen as quite detached and cold. And he actually realizes he's got, he's stuffed up so badly that he's damaged his relationship with his son. Those gems were not all. Your wife left you, my friend. She left you a son. Tell me, which would she have you value more? We always like to imagine, as part of a backstory, that she died defending her child, because that's one of his last binds to Legolas. Your mother loved you more than anyone, more than life. Threndwheel began to realize that son, that living, breathing, child is far more important and valuable than those cold white gems but he now knows that he's going to have to let his son go where will you go i do not know go north find the dunadai i wrote that scene invoking aragorn i never thought it would get shot i thought this has got nothing to do with anything it's just utter geekdom and I showed it to Pete and Fran, and they both immediately went, yeah, love it. <laughs> Let's do it. There's a young ranger amongst them. You should meet him. When Thranduil says to Legolas, go and find this ranger, he's speaking the truth with the prescience that elves have, but also, I think, his own wish that his own son, you know, might, in fact, surpass his own deeds. His father, Arathorn, was a good man. His son might grow to be a great one. He's also acknowledging greatness in Legolas and acknowledging that his son may be a wiser man than he is. It was an expression of love and apology, I guess. That was the moment that my story is nicely brought to a close as a character that would leave the Mirkwood realm to be a part of the Fellowship of the Ring. I think it's important to realize that we also have Thranduil, who is now ready to play his part. It's there in the background of Lord of the Rings, in the appendices. During the War of the Ring, while Minas Tirith is being assailed in the south, Sauron sends forces against the elven realms of the north. Thranduil and his army of elves repel the orcs that attack Mirkwood. Basically, they tie up a huge amount of Sauron's resources and they prevent the north from falling. Randall is now a character going forward with a sense of purpose that is not motivated by loss or by personal gain, but by a genuine desire to help. 
He's a totally different character to the one that we met in the beginning of The Hobbit.